It's time to set aside the superficial. It's time to go deeper. It's time to engage in truth. Here's John Bornstein. Well, everybody, welcome back to Engage in Truth. This is John Bornstein. I'm a senior pastor of Calvary Fellowship Fountain Valley Church right here in Colorado Springs, and I'm thrilled that you're tuning in again. We are continuing in a powerful study in which we are examining the two roads that were presented by Jesus Christ, the pathway unto life and the path that leads to death and wide that it is. Narrow is the gate, narrow is the road that leads unto life, and wide is the gate that leads unto destruction. And so as we examine this very profound truth that we read in the Gospel of Matthew, what we're looking at here over these next few weeks is really uh, some version of, I don't know, maybe a microcosm of apologetics, a summarized version of how we're to give a defense for the the things that we believe, the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And, and to really help us in this study, what we've been doing last week especially, was to begin by reading some of the quotes that have often been cited to famous atheists. The words that they cited, they spoke these even in their final days leading up to their last breath. And as we examine that, what we find is there's hopelessness. These individuals were right at their final days into their final breath, and there was no hope to be found in them. These individuals who claimed to have the answers to life, individuals who many looked up to, even today, because perhaps they were philosophers of ancient times and individuals of great prominence or stature, individuals of wealth even, and people looked up to them and wanted to know what made them tick. What were their beliefs? And unfortunately, as they were seeking the treasures of this earth, they neither knew God nor proclaimed him nor desired to know him, and this left them empty in the very final moments. And so what we want to do is be convicted by this and take us into the depths of Scripture so that we know what we believe and why. And to those who are listening who haven't made a decision for Christ, or if you're living a very nominal practice of worship where you just haven't really been set apart at all. There are no fruits of righteousness coming from you. Perhaps you you raised your hand in church one day and you said you're going to give your life to the Lord, but you have really done nothing with it. And you continue to live as the world lives. These are the kind of broadcasts you need to hear that it's time to make a decision. You can't walk the middle ground. You can't be the church of Laodicea where you're neither hot nor cold. You need to make a decision for Jesus Christ and declare that allegiance and be known because you don't want to blend in with the world anymore, but you want to be known as a follower of Jesus Christ. You want to declare him boldly before men as Christ will then claim you and declare you boldly before the Father. And so this is a convicting study. Let me take us back to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 for a moment. He says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. We have a great hope that is in us. And so it's, it's a time to understand the why and to know what we believe and to be able to convey that with passion. Do you live this and believe this or not? And so to help us in this discussion, Dr. Steve Ford is back in the studio with me. Dr. Ford, welcome back to Engage in Truth. Thanks, John. That's why you are such a great preacher. I'm just here. I'm thinking, amen, amen, amen to everything that you're saying. That was such a wonderful intro and, and so sad. So many of these people who were considered brilliant by the world standards got it wrong. They totally missed the mark and there's no second chance. Like you said last episode, it's for man wants to die and then the judgment. There is no second chance after this life. This is our opportunity to choose for all eternity. That's right. And so we wanted to read a scripture in regards to God's wrath on unrighteousness. It's Romans 1, 18 to 23. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and righteousness because what may be, may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, birds, four-footed animals, and creeping things. Mm, It's a powerful text. 
Well, last week, and and I encourage you, please go back and listen to it. You can find it at calvaryfountain.com. We examined seven famous atheists and their final words. And so today we want to also examine a few more, perhaps seven more even here today. But we're not going to leave you with that, because what they say is very discouraging. And that's the point. We want you to hear from the supposed famous and the wealthy and those who had it all together, or the appearance of such, the illusion of such in their lives, when all it was was fleeting. They were laying up treasures on this earth, and there was nothing to take with them into eternal life. In fact, the only outcome was judgment. They were going into a dark place unto judgment before Almighty God with no hope in the afterlife. And so we want you to hear their words. We want you to be convicted by it. But then we're going to leave you with the hope that is found in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So, Dr. Ford, what's the first one you have for us? The first one is Napoleon Bonaparte. As you know, French emperor, he mm. brought death to millions and just, just to satisfy his own ambition and world conquest. Mm. He said, I die before my time and my body will be given back to the earth. Such is the fate of him who has been called the great Napoleon. What an abyss between my deep misery and the eternal kingdom of Christ. Wow. And in that quote, you see that he acknowledges there is a Christ yeah, who has right. an eternal kingdom. Right, right. Right. And so whether or not that truth was finally made known to him in his final moment, even if he had one more breath to right. give, all it takes. the Lord would have received him. Amen. And, and so even in that, you, you wonder, I mean, it, the hardness of the hearts of men is beyond description. Right. And we talked about that when we were going through the millennial study, that at right. the very end of a thousand years with the glorified Lord, there will still be countless millions who turn on the Lord and choose the lie and death and destruction over the hope that is in Jesus Christ. Yeah. And so here is a man who declared it as such and yet still chose not to right. humble himself in repentance before Jesus Christ yeah. our Lord. How about Sir Francis Newport? I'll read his. In fact, he was, uh, you can learn a little bit more about him at the English Atheists Club, right? And that kind of tells you a little bit about this man. Uh, but you need not tell me there is no God, for I know there is one and that I am in his presence. Okay, so far so good. <laughs> but here's what he goes on to say. You need not tell me there is no hell. I feel myself already slipping. Wretches, Cease your idle talk about there being hope for me. I know I am lost forever. Oh, that fire. Oh, the insufferable pangs of hell. Oh, that I could lie for a thousand years upon the fire that is never quenched to purchase the favor of God and be united to him again. But it is a fruitless wish. Millions and millions of years will bring me no nearer the end of my torments than one poor hour. Oh, eternity, eternity, forever and forever. Oh, the insufferable pangs of hell. Wow. 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 That gives me goosebumps. Oh, it does. It's so sad. To hear those kind of words coming out of a man who acknowledges that there's no hope where he's headed, and yet the hope is right before him. Right. If we'd only give bended knee and accept Jesus Christ, if you confess with your mouth, Lord Jesus, right. and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. And yet, yeah. his hardened heart would not accept the truth. Yep. Scripture tells us that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So mm. like a friend of mine says, do it now or do it later. But either way, you're going to do it. Right. So you might as well do it now and accept the free gift of salvation right. and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Another quote we had was from Charles the Ninth, the French king. Urged on by his mother, he gave the order for the massacre of the French Huguenots, in which 15,000 souls were slaughtered in Paris alone and 100,000 in other areas of France. Wow. This was done for no other reason than that they loved Jesus Christ. Wow. Hmm. What an abomination. The guilty king suffered miserably for years after the event. He finally died bathed in blood bursting from his veins. To his physicians, he said in his last hours, asleep or awake, I see the mangled forms of the Huguenots passing before me. They drop with blood. They point at their open wounds. Oh, that I had spared at least the little infants at the bosom. What blood? I know not where I am. How will all this end? What shall I do? I am lost forever. I know it. Oh, I have done wrong. Mm. Wow. I mean, that, that type of burden of the decisions in this flesh to take life 
to to wear the consequences of that sin and not to release it to his Savior. Right. I mean, he has given us the freedom from our iniquity. In Hebrews, he says that he will remember our lawless deeds no more, right. as, as if sending them from the east to the west, That's never right. for the two to meet again, yeah. that God chooses to be forgetful, to right. not remember right. our yeah. iniquities. That's the hope in Jesus Christ that I can go in pure and undefiled right. because of his atonement behind me, Amen. Up over me, upon me. Yep. And that's the the purity of the bride of Christ that's presented back to him by his own work right. to purge the sin from us. That's hopefulness. That is. I mean, no matter what I've done in this flesh, it can be cleansed wholly, fully in Amen. Jesus Christ. That's what he needed. Yeah. He would have been set free from yeah. the shackles of this bondage had he just confessed faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, David Strauss, he says, my philosophy leaves me utterly forlorn. I feel like one caught in the merciless jaws of an automatic machine, not knowing at what time one of its great hammers may crush me. Wow. Now, I do find it interesting to note that after he published The Life of Jesus crit- Critically Examined, which is a book in which Strauss attempts to negate the divine nature of Jesus and claim that the Gospels are mythical instead of historical, that Strauss was forced to take leave from the university where he taught. And during his leave of absence, he was elected to a German political chamber position, but was forced to resign due to his religious views. He then published another work titled The Old and New Faith, again disputing the divine nature of Jesus in favor of of a version of Darwinism when he suddenly fell ill and died. Wow. Okay, so you talk about the Lord not turning a blind eye and deaf ear when someone knows the truth of him and is now trying to make the case to deceive the world that he is not him, right? right? Trying to take away the royalty, the majesty, the identity of Christ. So it's not that he didn't know. Right. He knew who Jesus was, and he, in the hardened heart like Judas, chose to reject the free gift of salvation, rather choosing the flames of hell than to give bend and knee to Jesus Christ wow. forever and ever. I mean, that that strikes a blow into my heart for it him does. as well. It definitely. I think you made a great point, too, that there is nothing that any of us can do. There's only one unforgivable sin, and that is to, re, you know, obviously to to reject that that saving opportunity and offer by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to, right. you know, to say that the things of God are the things of Satan, to say that good is evil, just like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think it's important that that everyone out there understand that there, there's nothing that'll make you too filthy. There's nothing in you too dirty that Jesus Christ can't make white and pure and clean. That's right. Amen. Amen. We have a quote from Joseph Stalin. We all are familiar with Joseph Stalin. And part of this is also from an interview with his daughter telling of her father's death. My father died a difficult and terrible death. God grants an easy death only to the just. Hmm. At what seemed the very last moment, he suddenly opened his eyes and cast a glance over everyone in the room. It was a terrible glance, insane or perhaps angry. He, He left or his left hand was raised as though he were pointing up to something above, bringing down a curse on us all. The gesture was full of menace. Hmm. The next moment, he was dead. Wow, wow. And, and I have that quote here. Can I, let me read this. Um, just, I, you know, as he literally choked to death as we watched is that quote. Wow. And I just find that, you know, as, as you think about the men who had great disdain for the Lord in, in, a, in a raised fist of rebellion, almost like Herod himself. We, we've heard the stories of Herod the Great, and I've even taken tour groups there in Israel, uh, you know, both to Masada, to the Herodian, and there at the Herodian where his uh, sarcophagus was kept and raided. Uh, it is said that at the time of his death, he wanted thousands of Jews to be executed so that they would be in lamenting remorse rather than celebrating right. his oh, death. So sick. And, and yet here's a man who knew, even of this Jesus who was in his territory, he knew he was a king. He was fearful of losing his throne. And, and so rather than give submitted bended knee before him, he chose to execute or seek to destroy Jesus rather than submit to his reign. And, and so you see this time and time again of the men of power who are in love with their power, and yet their power is fleeting. You look at the Egyptians time and time again as they would build these immaculate tombs. I mean, right. even ones that we celebrate today and look, oh, look how wonderful and glorious and splendorous those are. And yet they are nothing more than a tomb that have been raided time and time again. 
there is no hope. There was no passage for them into the afterlife with hope because they sought a, a life of power and fleeting pleasures. They did not seek to give bend and knee before the God of heaven and earth, the right. Yahweh himself. And, and so you see that in Joseph Stalin amongst many others who are dictators through and through. Uh, we have another one here of Anton LaVey. Um, and just to mention his name just grieves my heart because we know this man, his whole life was just a, a, a fraud. Um, he, he even created the Church of Satan, and his daughter claimed that in their, uh, their time together behind the scenes, he admitted that the whole thing was just to make money, that he plagiarized the Book of Satan, he did all these horrible things, sexual abuses to students, physically abused his wife and his wow. family. He was a complete fraud through and through, and so this man was nothing but a, a path of destruction for others and a, uh, just a, a force of destruction in and of his own choices. But his last quote is, uh, this is what at least we have as a quote. He says, oh my, oh my, what have I done? There is something very wrong. There is something very wrong. So terrifying. It is. It is very terrifying. And you think that in this moment, even though he knew uh, the, the Lord's decrees of his word, he chose, like some of the others that we've already cited, to uh, give a countering message you, you meet with many atheists, they actually know more about the Bible than many Christians do. Right. So they're very well versed in scripture because they want to try to justify their sinful position. They want to try to justify the fact that they're not accountable to anybody, especially a higher power whom they will stand before someday. So here's another man, case in point, who knew the truth, rejected the truth, wrote an opposition to it, and then in his final hour, there is no peace. Wow. Shocker. Right. Yeah. No, no peace, as he knows that there is a destination of only destruction. Yeah. And, and that's why we, we grieve, even as we read these here before you today. So many of these remind me of the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, and where they're afraid of the dark, they're afraid of being alone. And that's really what we see with the rich man. That's right. Winds up in that same situation. Another quote we have is from Gandhi. Though raised in a Hindu family at his death, he said, for the first time in 50 years, I find myself in the slew of despond. All about me is darkness. I am praying for light. And as we had talked about, this is a, you know, we off air, we had talked about this by the world standards at the time, very famous person who is, who is considered to be a very, very good person who had a lot of, done a lot of good things. That's right. But of course, by the Lord's standard, you know, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's right. That's right. And, and you know, we've, we've talked about a time or two already of Matthew chapter seven, the Lord presented two pathways and that's it. Two roads, two gates. And then just in our few minutes, let me just highlight that for us, Dr. Ford, because I think it's important that we're not leaving here on a negative note, because if we turn to the philosophies of men, the wisdom of men, we will be discouraged. We will find no purpose, no hope. It is ever fleeting. It is ever shifting. It's like building a foundation on sand, That's because right. today it'll be one thing, tomorrow will be something else. That's moral relativism. What may be right for you today will be different tomorrow. It's all based on our emotions and, and what the uh, population at large may can, uh, agree is some form of righteousness or morality. And, and there is no substance in that ever. And we see that society's ever changing. So there's one constant truth, and it is found in the holy word of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Listen to what he says, Matthew seven thirteen to 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. There are only two gates, two paths, only two destinies before every man, and each of us must choose one or the other. And many would suppose that men are confronted with an almost infinite number of alternatives to them, because that's the way men think. We don't want to be limited to only one way, but the Lord Jesus narrows our choices to only two, the world's way in religions or Christianity. Right. The world's religions rest upon and are defined by man's work, according to Isaiah 64, 6, and Christianity rests on God's work on behalf of man. The small gate is the entrance to the narrow way, the way which leads to eternal life. And that gate is our Lord Jesus himself. In his very words, he says, then Jesus said to them again, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. 
The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And again, we've already mentioned it, John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And and then he says to stand in God's presence, the way he describes this. Listen, it requires total perfection, no blemish, not one. That's because he's that holy. So the only way to stand in his presence and dwell with him forever is to be perfect, according to Matthew 5, 48. So to have perfection, you have to be covered with perfection. And that's where Jesus has covered you with his perfect blood. Just as the blood of the lamb covered the doorposts in Egypt, that they would not die in the presence of God, but live, so he has covered you as well. He says in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, that knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And so likewise, Jesus invites all of us into eternity but we're not dressed appropriately. Therefore, we must put on a new wardrobe, but the clothing alone will not suffice. So we need to put on Jesus so that what is seen is wholly him and not our filthy rags. That's why Paul tells us in Galatians, for as many of you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. It's more than just a change of clothing. It is putting on all of him. And with this new covering, you will also receive a new heavenly body that will bear his image and will no longer be the image of the dust of man from 1 Corinthians 15, 49. We have often heard it, I did it my way, right? Right, I mean, we think of the Frank Sinatra song or maybe even Burger King, have it your way. (laughs) That is not to be a commercial for them. But we always want it our way. And that's why the world seems to struggle with Christians who declare that there's only one way. Why? Because God is the one who declared that there's only one way. And men would gladly choose any other way because it's not the way of man. It doesn't allow us to keep our pride or possessions or our preferences. It means that we have to totally submit to him and empty of self to receive all of Christ. And so I'm encouraged in this that in Matthew 12, 30, he says that he who is not with me is against me and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. You say, how am I encouraged by that? Because there really is only two ways. And if you're with the Lord, there is wholly the hope that leads to life. And it's not a hope maybe, it's a hope assured. And that's what we want for all of our listeners here today, that you have hope assured, knowing that when you breathe your last, that it's God in Colossians chapter one who reminds us that it's the Lord Jesus holds everything together. The very cells that make up your heart He holds that together. He's keeping your heart beating, and he wants to have a relationship with you. Don't be like these famous atheists who had no hope. The end of them was a demise unto destruction. Don't be like them. Choose rather the path of life that is difficult. It's not an easy journey, and it requires us to lay down our lives unto him and service to him. And yes, you might be mocked. Yes, it may be affliction and difficulty that awaits each and every day, but we have the hope in Jesus Christ who offer himself, and he gives us by way of prayer that we have a voice into the throne room of God who will work on our behalf. He will fight for us. He is with us through the difficulties of the days that we face. And Dr. Ford, I know that we're out of time, and I know that your heart has often been just that people would know Jesus Christ through this broadcast, and I I believe that they've received the gospel message here today. Oh, definitely. And I would just encourage anybody uh, out there who is on the fence. There are only two types of people, as as you've mentioned. There are people who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior and those who haven't. That's the dividing line within the Christian faith. You're either for him or against him. Yeah, and for those who think, well, you know, I'm not— I'm, a, I'm not that bad. I'm not as bad as that guy. The The problem with that type of thinking is that the standard for judgment is Jesus Christ. It's not your neighbor. It's not your friend. It's not the guy at work. That's right. You're going to be compared to Jesus Christ. That's the standard that you have to meet to get into heaven. Yeah. And we can't do it without his imputed righteousness. That's like right. I said, all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. 
And we need Jesus Christ to save us. That's right. And I hope that today you make a decision for the Lord Jesus. If you've been walking a middle ground and you've been lukewarm, make a new passionate decree in your life today. Declare before your friends and family, you will walk with the Lord and bear his standard before the world as an ambassador for Jesus Christ. I hope you've been encouraged today. Thank you for listening to Engage in Truth. To listen to this again, to get involved with a community of believers at Calvary Fellowship Fountain Valley Church, visit us at calvaryfountain.com and services are 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. on Sundays. We'd love to see you there. God bless you, my friends. Take care.